There is a handout here this morning. We started last week our series on roadblocks in personal evangelism. I decided this week I'm just going to give you the whole the whole thing. So it's it's uh, seven pages. Uh, so four pages front, front and back, and three pages. So uh, it's. I know it's a lot of words, it's a lot of text on there, but again, that's by design because I included scripture references, I included uh, a written out answer on it. So, grab one of these handouts, Steph and Audrey are passing those out, so if you didn't get one last week, if you got one last week, then you have the first couple pages, but if you did not... Let me take just a second here. I'll introduce it, and then I'll give you the first. I think we only have a couple of blanks, but I'll give those to you just so that you have them. The point of this, this series, we're coming into the holiday season. We're coming into that time when you're going to be with family and, and friends and loved ones. And this time of year, it's, it's very common for there to be kind of a softening. Towards, towards spiritual things. Folks who would normally tell you to, to just get lost, they don't want to hear what you have to say about Christ. Many times around this time of year in the holiday season, they'll, they'll be a little bit more open to it. Maybe you've got that loved one who you've been praying for, who you've witnessed to at Thanksgiving years ago, but you're, you're still burdened for them, don't think that they've trusted the Lord, and so you're wanting to, to talk with them about that. We're talking about sharing the gospel. The gospel, of course, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. We see this in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That's kind of the, the gospel in a nutshell. And so when you're sharing the gospel or when you're handing out a gospel tract, don't take for granted that you see, well, this is a gospel tract. Don't take for granted that it has the gospel in it. Unfortunately, there are many gospel tracts that are printed that don't have the resurrection in them or that don't don't call to repentance it's you, you need to be careful we have a few different tracks out here on on our track rack at the church I, all of them they have the complete gospel in them they they're a good presentation they would be a good opportunity a good tool for you to take but we are prone to run into roadblocks as we share our faith to that end we are thinking ahead to some of the more common roadblocks that we may encounter in our effort to obey 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, which tells us to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You need to prepare so that you have an answer, so that you can share the truth. You're going to, you're going to run into some... Uh, some opposition, you're going to get some pushback, so you need to have thought through it. As we go over these, these different things, e even on the handout, and there are, there are 12 total that we have on here. If we have questions or, or feedback, we may have more. But I have 12 that, that I have, have run into over the years. As you look over these, as you hear the answers that, that I've given in some of these situations, maybe you'd say, well, I wouldn't say it like that. Great. That's fine. It doesn't matter that you say it how I would say it. What matters is that you have an answer and that it's a biblical one. We need to tie everything that we, that we say to Scripture because ultimately when we get right down to it, my opinion, your opinion, and the person who we're witnessing to, all of our opinions hold equal weight. The only thing that gives us, that gives us authority is the fact that we're speaking the words of God. Last week, we dealt with two uh, responses that I, I think I asked you last week. How many of you have, have seen this response? And, and these are two very, very common ones that we dealt with last week. Number one that you see there on your handout. Well, I don't think God would send people to hell. And there are some variations on this. I, if God is loving, then how can he send someone to hell for all of eternity? I'll give you just the, the blanks here. I'm not going not gonna to re-preach the ones that we looked at last week. This statement, uh, under number one, letter A, this statement reveals a misunderstanding of God's attributes. Attributes is the first blank there on your, on your handout. Uh, we understand that God's, 
God's justice, God's love, God's mercy, God's holiness, he manifests all of these in perfect balance. God is not loving at the expense of his holiness. He is both loving and holy. We know that justice and mercy met at the cross of Jesus Christ where he took our sins upon himself. It said the, the blank there in number one letter C in the answer it's God is perfect and will always act in accordance with all of his attributes with perfect balance. Balance is the second blank there. Number two, the second roadblock that we face. And again, you've heard this one. What gives you the right to say that you're right and everyone else is wrong? Uh, again, sometimes this would be phrased as, I believe that there are lots of ways to God. But this person is assuming that there are many truths. You'll note I have that in quotes. Many truths and all are equally right. That's simply not the case. Down at the bottom of your page, there's two blanks. Truth is absolute and exclusive. Truth is absolute and exclusive. And then on page number two, just to get you caught up on the blanks, the blank there in the answer you will never believe anything if you feel that you first have to disprove every other opinion. Disprove is the, the word there in that blank. Let's come to the, the third roadblock. You've probably faced this roadblock before if you've tried to share your faith uh, in, in any degree. <clears throat> Occasionally you'll run up against this one. Somebody says, well, yeah, I think I'm saved. Sometimes, I just don't feel like it. Yeah, I think I'm saved, but sometimes I, I don't feel like it. How many of you have faced this in some, in some way or shape or form in, in your sharing of truth? Okay, this, this is out there. You'll face this from time to time. To this, I would respond that eternity is way too long to rest upon something as subjective and ever-changing as our feelings. Have you noticed how easily your feelings change? <laughs> your feelings, they, they depend on what you ate last night. If you eat a pizza at 12 p.m. and go to bed, likelihood is your feelings might tell you all sorts of things before it's time to get out of bed. Okay? Your feelings change as to what you eat, what you sleep. A fever can affect your feeling? No, eternity is too long for us to base on something like that. Now, Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And we talked a little bit about this last week. It's not he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he exists. The Bible assumes that, that God exists. Rather, it's he that cometh to God must believe that he the God of Scripture, as he is revealed in Scripture, exists, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So the, the question is, when we're talking with somebody who says, well, yeah, I, I think I'm saved, but sometimes I don't feel like it, we need, to, we need to backtrack and we need to talk to them about faith. <clears throat> faith is not, is not based on feeling. Faith is based on fact. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not saved by our feelings. We're not saved by the works that would give us those feelings. Now, I do have on here a, a kind of a caution. If someone approaches you and they declare that I don't feel saved, you need to deal with the very distinct possibility that they are not. You, you need to be aware of that. You, you don't need the, that person you say, well, we've gone to church. We've gone to church together for years. Of course you're saved. Don't say that. Well, well, I was there when you made a profession of faith. This would be a lot of times you've got a child, maybe your child or maybe a grandchild who comes to you. This happens. Yeah, Grandma, I don't feel saved. Well, I was at Bible school when you said that you trusted Christ. Of course you're saved. Don't say that. Don't say that because what ends up happening is you have a young child who's putting their, who's putting their faith not in Christ and what he did for them on the cross, but in your word that they've done something. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. You need to be careful of saying this. 
because, now, what's another reason that someone who is genuinely saved, they have trusted Christ, and again, I don't have any way of knowing that, but someone is genuinely saved, they've genuinely placed their faith in Christ, but they've gone into sin, and we'll deal with this in a few moments on, on, a, on another question, but when, some, when a believer goes into sin, sin in the life of a believer can cause guilt. And it can lead to doubting of salvation. Sometimes it's you, you hear somebody say, well, if I was really saved, I wouldn't struggle with things like this, would I? Well, and the answer to that is, well, you might. You might. The, the fact that it is a struggle is, is an encouraging thing. Sin is something that believers do struggle with. Again, the fact that it is a struggle is usually a good sign. But the Apostle Paul even dealt with sin. You can't read through Romans 7, the end of Romans 7 into the beginning of Romans 8, and come away with the idea that Christians arrive at this, this pinnacle. We, we kind of plateau and, well, I don't struggle with sin anymore. <laughs> well, Paul was a pretty good Christian, and he said in Romans 7, 23, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. We've talked about this even even in our last series, we have a pull that would take us towards sin. We sing in the song, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. But interestingly enough, God has ordained that the, the way in which we are born again, how are we saved? We're saved by grace through faith. How do we live in victory? By grace through faith. He says in Colossians 2, verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus our Lord. You received him by faith, and so you walk in him. You were justified by faith, so be sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. Again, be careful. And I, I, I can't say this enough because I've dealt with an awful lot of young people. Who've, who've come to me and they said, Pastor Ben, I, I don't feel saved, but, but my mom told me I am. Be, be oh so careful. Don't say to someone that you are saved. Many people are walking around, especially in an area like this where there is a, uh, where there is a, 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 a bent towards, towards things biblical. There are a lot of people who've grown up in, in churches of different kinds. There are a lot of people who would wander around clinging to a false hope of salvation because some well-meaning and well-intentioned person felt the need to help them with assurance. If they are truly saved, they have the Holy Spirit of God within them to witness to that fact. The Holy Spirit can give assurance. We don't give assurance. I, it, would be, it would be wrong for me to go to, to one of my daughters who have all made a profession of faith for me to go to one of my daughters and say, well, honey, you're saved, don't you remember? If they don't remember, then, then let's, let's go through it again. Let's, let's talk through it. Let's, let's go down this path once again. I've given you this illustration before about feelings and, and assurance and, and such, but it bears repeating in this context. Do you remember this? This was from when we did Living the Exchange some, some years back. There are three men. Their names are Mr. Fact, Mr. Faith, and Mr. Feeling. And they're walking one after another on the top of a wall. The wall's kind of narrow, and they're all walking on this wall. When they're all in the proper order, when Mr. Mr. Fact is leading, Mr. Faith is looking at Mr. Fact, Mr. Feeling will follow along. Sometimes he falls a little bit behind, but eventually they'll all get where they're going. The problem is, when, we, when we're going to face some issues is when Mr. Faith turns around and he takes his eyes off of the facts and he starts looking at the feeling and he's walking on the wall like this. What's going to happen? He's going to fall off the wall. And faith and feeling will both go down. Our, re our feelings are not a reliable source of truth. Where is truth? God's Word. I've told you before... And, and I think it's a great exercise. I'm not saying I'm going to start doing it. I had a professor in college who he would walk up to, to people in the hallway. He'd say, are you saved? They'd say, yes, yeah, I'm saved. And he'd hand them their Bible. He'd say, prove it. 
Can you go to God's word and say, I know that I'm saved because this is what God said. And I, I have placed my dependence in Christ alone for salvation. If you can't, then I would encourage you, you're going to struggle with, with those doubts. You're going to struggle with assurance until you get the, the three men in line. Until you have, we lead with facts, faith follows the facts, and feelings will catch up. But we're not depending on feelings. Let's look at number four. Number four, our fourth question here is, kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah, I'm, I'm saved, but I'm backslidden. I've heard this an awful lot. Sometimes they'll phrase it. Well, I, I'm saved, but I've kind of drifted away from God over the years. I've, there's some distances there. Now, this may indeed be the case with some people who you come in contact with. That this is, we, we can't say, no, you're not saved. Just like we can't say, yes, you are saved. We can't make an absolute statement and say, you're absolutely not saved. Either one of those would be wrong. But it may be the case. Is it possible for a Christian to, to backslide, to, to go into sin, to, to live after the flesh? Well, absolutely it's possible. The New Testament spends an awful lot of time and space telling us, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Meaning we have an option. If we walk in the flesh, we're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're going we're to have all sorts of a problem in our life. Sin in the life of a believer is a possibility. I, I've, I've said this many times, even from this pulpit. It is possible for a believer to live in sin. But it is not possible for a believer to be happy in sin. Why do I know this? Because Revelation 3.19, God speaking to believers. This is Christ addressing the church. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You've, you've been in, a, you, you've been in a, a grocery store and you see the little one who has gotten away with murder his whole life. And he wants that piece of candy. And to express his displeasure with the fact that his mom is not getting him that piece of candy, he proceeds to make everyone within a 20-yard circle of him miserable because he's down on the floor and he's, he's, having, he's pitching a fit. In, in that moment, who, who really needs the correction, the child or the parent? Both need the correction. Right? We, we would look at a parent who, who lets their child do that on a consistent and regular basis. We'd say, man, there's some issues there. God is too good of a parent to let us get away with living in sin. God is a, we, we have in scripture, we have the example of the father. God is the perfect father. God loves you too much to let you go in sin and go your own way without correcting you. That's why when I correct my daughters, I say, honey, I, I'm doing this not because I like to do it. I'm doing this because I love you. I'm doing this because I can't let you get away with this. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. When you're talking to the person who says, yeah, I'm saved, but I'm backslidden. You need to warn them. As a believer, it's your responsibility. The Bible says in Galatians, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual... Restore such a one. You speak up in that moment. You warn them, hey, you know what? If that is the case, if you've trusted the Lord as your personal Savior, but now you're living in sin, you're walking on dangerous ground. You have God's word that he'll chasten you. God says he will chasten a backslidden Christian to bring them back into fellowship. 1 John 1, 9 is an exceptional comfort to those who backslidden and are sick of their sin. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his faults. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 
we just memorized, just finished memorizing Psalm 103 as a, as a church family, where he talks about how the Lord hasn't rewarded us according to our iniquities. We serve a good and a gracious and a merciful and a long-suffering God. But again, God will, will manifest all of his attributes in perfect balance. And God loves his children too much to let them live in sin unchallenged and unchastened. God has the capacity to make you sick of what you were sick for. And that's a good thing. Sometimes our heart, our, we're, we're prone towards the flesh. We want to go after this. God can make you sick of that thing which you were once sick for. Let me give you the answer here from your handout. <clears throat> for number four, letter B, a Christian cannot live in a perpetual state of sin without the judgment of God in their life. God has said that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This means the only obstacle between you and your relationship with God is your willingness to confess and forsake your sin. There is no sin that is beyond the forgiveness of God. That's something that you also may run into. Well, I don't think God could forgive me of this. I can take you through, especially through the Old Testament. Boy, there's some examples of some pretty heinous sins that God forgave. And God still used them. You think of, of two of the big characters. You got, you got Moses, you got David. Both men. One, the, one is, is greatly used of God. He spoke to God face to face. The other, the sweet psalmist of Israel who penned much of the book of Psalms and, and had a tremendous relationship with God. A man after God's own heart. Both of them murderers. God can forgive. So if this is the case where someone genuinely is backslidden, work to, work to help them back towards Christ. There's forgiveness. There's cleansing. Any questions? Um, we've covered two thus far. Any questions, comments that you have? Maybe a point of clarification that, that's needed. Or maybe maybe you say, I've, I've had a similar situation. What about this? Any Anything before we move on to number five? <clears throat> yes, sir. When you, when you make the statement, there's no sin beyond forgiveness of God. You just talk about confess sin. So you're not talking about sin of unbelief. No. The un Sin of unbelief, yeah, the, 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 un, the, the unpardonable sin, as it's called in, in Scripture, the unpardonable sin is to die outside of, of faith in Christ. And the reason that it is unpardonable is because you've rejected the only means of pardon. It's, can unbelief be forgiven? Yeah, you were in unbelief. I was in unbelief, and then I trusted Christ. But if you die in a state of unbelief, you can't be forgiven because time's up. It's appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. Yes, sir. Well, I know a fellow, he mentioned this to me. That, uh, uh, as long as we're not convicted, we're safe. And I told him that was a bunch of crap. <laughs> as long as we're not convicted. Yeah, that is. I said, you know, I look at that little song that. William Sr. said, I saw the light. Starts out, it says, I wandered aimlessly. You know, yeah. Life full of sin. I said, that, that fits 99% of the people. It fits 100% of the people. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and <coughs> conviction there. Well, we are all convicted. We, we all stand convicted before, before the judgment bar of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's good. I, I tell you, I, I have... I, have, I, I may have shared this story before. We have in our house, we have a, a chair. It's a Lazy Boy recliner, a smaller Lazy Boy recliner that my wife and I bought when we, were, we had just gotten married. And I, had, I bought it off of Craigslist when we were living in Pennsylvania. And I went to the man's house, uh, and it was, it was just kind of an odd situation. His name was Sholto, and he spoke with a, he, had a, he was from Ireland. He had an Irish accent. And, uh, and for whatever reason, I think I had an appointment that I had to get to. And so I didn't really have time to give this man the whole gospel. So I handed him a gospel tract. Uh, it, had our, it had the gospel and it had our, uh, our church's information. And, and I handed it to him. I said, hey, you know what? If ever I can, can be a help to you, uh, just give me a call. I'd love to talk with you because I, I, I 
was understanding that he did not know the Lord as his personal Savior. And I left, and I kind of forgot about it. We enjoyed the chair, and, and all was good. But uh, then one day, a, a few, it was some months later, my wife and I, I was preaching at a church in Maine, and it was about 11 o'clock that night, and I got a call from Shalto because the track had my phone number. And Shalto said, man, you know, I, I'm really dealing, I'm, I'm really struggling with, with some sin, and I, I really like to talk to you. I said, man, Shalto, I'd love to talk to you, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm 600 miles away. I can't meet with you. Can't, would you meet with, with my pastor? He said, well, one of the, I'm, I've, I've murdered people, and, uh, and I'm, I just feel terrible about it. I, I said, well, would you meet with my pastor who, at the time? So I called. He said, yeah, I'd meet with your pastor. So I called my pastor, and you can imagine how that conversation went in the middle of the night. Would you go meet with this murderer? Uh, he, really wants to, he really wants to talk to you. Uh, I said, how about the church? He said, how about a public place? Uh, and so they met at McDonald's. And uh, that, that night, Sholto, he had been in the IRA. He was a terrorist with the Irish Republican Army in Ireland. He had come to America, and he was just convicted about his sin. Long story short, very involved story, Sholto trusted the Lord as his personal Savior that night, placed his faith in Christ, and found forgiveness of all of that. And why did it happen? Well, because of the gospel is the power of God and salvation. God can forgive. The fact that somebody, well, I'm a murderer. Again, there's lots of, of people who have committed murder who will be in heaven with us for all of eternity. So don't, don't give up when they say, I've got sins. I don't think God can forgive. You say, oh, well, I didn't realize. I'll walk away. No, don't, don't do that. Rather, take them to the source of grace and mercy and peace and forgiveness that we have in Christ. Yeah. And, uh, as time goes on here, uh, all the migrants that have been coming up through, uh, even in Wayland here, we're having some folks that have been moving in. And uh, I confronted one of them even yesterday. And I was going to talk to him. He had no... No understanding of English whatsoever. And do you have any track? Maybe I'll have some tracks back here that uh, have some Spanish. We can get some. Yeah, you know, I didn't think right we now. had yep. any. Yep. We'll but, get some. Know, we don't need a bunch of them, but we ought to have a few. And then that's what I thought I could get you a track. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Could, uh, you can read and understand. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll get some get some tracks in, in Spanish. and uh, Carry a couple of those. Jim's got a couple right here. There, there you go. go. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Good. We'll, we'll get yep. some. All right, number five, number five, roadblock. This is this is one that you've probably faced before if you if you've ever uh, tried to share the faith. Well, my grandfather, my uncle, my brother, or something was a preacher, and there's a lot of times when when people say, "Oh, okay, well, have a good day then." No, don't walk away from this. Don't walk away from someone. This sort of a statement, well, well my, my brother was a preacher, my, my father was a, was a pastor. It is irrelevant to the gospel, except to perhaps inform you that they have some sort of a biblical framework to work off of as you explain the gospel. If their grandfather was a pastor, then maybe they're familiar with the gospel. So, so don't walk away because, well, I didn't realize you were already saved because your grandfather was a pastor. Because they're not saved because their grandfather was a pastor. They're only saved if they trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. This uh, Romans chapter 14 verse 12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. When that individual, whoever they are, when they stand before God, they're not going to stand behind their grandfather who was a pastor. They're going to stand alone and give an answer. The flaw in this thinking, this is the blank on your handout, is that the actions of others somehow have an effect on your standing before God. My children don't get a free pass into heaven because I'm a pastor. I don't get a free pass into heaven because my dad is a pastor. It, it's a personal decision. As you begin to share the gospel, perhaps... Maybe this is a person, and they, they have grown up in, in, in a scriptural setting. And as you share the gospel, maybe the person, they begin to quote all of the verses with you. Should you stop and just walk away and assume they got it? No, no. You, you bear down, you say, hey, the fact that they're quoting these verses with me, that's just all the more proof that the Holy Spirit can use 
those truths to impact them. There are an awful lot of people walking around who have a head knowledge of the truths of Scripture. They know the Bible stories because they grew up going to Sunday school or grew up in a church setting. But they've never accepted them by faith. Again, this response that, well, I have a, I have a preacher or a deacon or something in my family is not a reason to walk away from sharing the gospel. Rather, it's a reason to press ahead because they perhaps have a, a basis of this. When I was in the Philippines, the Philippines is a predominantly Catholic nation. When I was over there and I would be preaching to, to children in the public school, we would go into classrooms and preach the gospel in the, in the public school. Now, over there, they still have the, they have the Ten Commandments. They're still on the wall. And, and as I would quote, I would quote Romans 3.23 and John 3.16 and John 6.23. And as I would quote these verses, the vast majority of the children who I was preaching to would be quoting those verses with me. Why? Well, again, because they had a familiarity with it. They just hadn't accepted the gospel, many of them. So rather than viewing it as a roadblock, well, they already know, so I, I won't waste my time telling them what they already know. No, no, no. You, you continue on, share the gospel, share the truth, and allow the Spirit of God to, to make the difference, to make the application. And perhaps someone who's grown up in a church setting will trust Christ. Number six. Yes. In, in that particular case, it was her whole house. Israel was coming across. They were going to cross the Jordan River. This was before Joshua had led them into the land. They were coming in, and, and Rahab had helped the spies. She had a scarlet rope that was hanging out of her window. And they said, when we come into the land, you'll be saved and your house if you'll leave this, this rope hanging out of your window, which would take an act of faith because... The city officials were looking for how the spies got away. So for her to have a rope hanging out the window would be kind of, uh, uh, kind of convicting, perhaps, perhaps, for her. But in this case, she was saved, and whoever was in her house with her was saved. I don't believe that they were talking so much about eternal salvation as they were, we won't kill you. Right. Uh, and so she was saved. Uh, she and her family, who were Canaanites, they were, they were of the people of the land— they ended up living even even though. So it wasn't was, salvation that they were talking about. It was no. just their life. No, it wasn't. It was it was just we we're not going to kill you. Now it is interesting. I do believe that Rahab did come to know Christ. I think that she did trust in the Messiah who would come by her line. Incidentally, kind of interesting. Yes, sir. No, then that goes on to Acts in Acts sixteen thirty one where it talks about the household being. He's talking about believing the Lord Jesus Christ. So there they are talking about. And if, if they will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll be saved. And if your house believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will also be saved. There's not a there's there's no such thing. Scripture doesn't speak anywhere of a of a family salvation. Well, the father trusted Christ, so the, the kids are good. No. It just sounds yeah. It sounds it like does it. sound similar. Now let me let me say in that same vein of thought, it is, it is a statistical fact that when the father in a household trusts Christ, there is a very high likelihood that the rest of the family will come to faith in Christ. Uh, the vast majority of people who are saved today are children under the age of 12. When a child trusts Christ, there's a, there's a chance, and I'm talking statistically, there's a chance that the rest of the family will come to know Christ as a result of the testimony of the child, but it's not a big chance. When the mother comes to know Christ, it raises that, that statistical chance that the rest of the family, but the highest percentage of whole families that come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior by individually trusting Christ is when the father trusts Christ, 
the mother ends up trusting Christ, the kids trust Christ. That's, that's the way that it just typically works. There are exceptions to that rule, but I think that the exceptions actually prove the rule rather than disprove the rule. Any other questions on that, on that note, on that line? Number three, let me give it to you. Number three is, the, the blank there is, uh, there's two blanks, subjective and feelings. It is unwise to base something as important as eternal salvation on subjective and ever-changing feelings. By the way, I have, I have this up here, uh, and it has all of the answers on it in red ink. So if you, if you do miss something or you'd like to, to fill those out, you're more than welcome to. Let's, let's briefly, we'll introduce number, number six. We've, we've kind of looked at this idea. Well, I think I've done enough good things in my life to outweigh my bad deeds, so God will have to let me into heaven. There are many variations of how this is phrased, but you need to inform this person that the idea of a giant scale which weighs our good deeds and our bad deeds is nowhere found in Scripture. There's no, there's no such, so, no such fact, no such theory proposed in the Word of God. In fact, the Bible says quite the opposite. The Bible talks about our good deeds in Isaiah 64, 6. It says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses, all our good deeds, are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Your good deeds, the things that you say, well, these will surely outweigh my bad deeds. Even what we've done, which is, is good, is considered filthy rags. And I've, I've shared with you that the filthy rags there, it's, it's a pretty gross idea. <laughs> it's the idea of biohazard waste. The filthy rags were the rags that the lepers would wrap their sores in. That's how God views the very best that can be done to achieve heaven on our own. The blanks here that you have uh, for number number six, it says, uh, God does not require goodness from us. A lot of people say, I'm good enough. Well, God doesn't require goodness from us. He requires perfection. I'll prove it to you. Matthew 5, verse 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. First Peter chapter 1, verse 16 is actually quoting another verse from the Old Testament in Leviticus that says, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. God doesn't require that you be good or better than somebody else. God requires that you be perfect as he is, holy as he is. And obviously we fall short of this. Obviously we fall short of perfection. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 goes on and further tells us bad news. For all have, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have a sin problem. The person who you're sharing the gospel with, who thinks they're good enough, they have a sin problem. Even if they could, and they couldn't, but even for the sake of argument, if they could be perfect from here till their deathbed, they're still not perfect because they have a past. They're, they're not perfect because, we looked at this last week in James, he that keepeth the whole law, yet offendeth in one point, is guilty of all. Jesus came, and since he's God, he had no sin of his own, which enabled him to take the punishment of our sins upon himself. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he, God, the Father, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You could sub in for that perfection or holiness or righteousness. <coughs> Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself so that he can give us his righteousness, his holiness, his perfection. There's no scale to weigh our good deeds versus our bad deeds, but one day we'll stand before God, and the only hope we have is if we're found accepted because of what Christ has done for us, that we have accepted Christ, and thus we are accepted in the Beloved. 
Let me give you the answer from the handout as we close here for number six. The Bible says, when we come to God for salvation, our works do not matter at all. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. God knew that if we could work to attain salvation, we'd brag about it when we'd attained it. But the fact is, no amount of good works will get us to heaven because God doesn't ask for goodness. He asks for perfection. No one is perfect. Romans 6, 23. That's why we need Jesus Christ and what he did for us on Calvary. It's only by accepting through faith what he's done that we can ever be made acceptable in the eyes of God. Again, I know this is a wordy handout, but part of the reason that it's a wordy handout is because it has these answers written out. And maybe as you look at these, you say again, well, that's not how I would say it. That's fine. Then figure out how you would say it. But say it. Go out. And find those people who need to hear the gospel, especially in this holiday season. You're going to be around lost friends, co-workers, and family members. Maybe who you've shared the gospel with. Maybe you lost count of how many times. Maybe you, you tried to share the gospel with them and, and they gave you one of these responses and it kind of sidetracked you. Maybe you, you kind of <coughs> shut down. Well, hopefully now, armed with, with these answers... That we have from scripture. Again, not my answers. God's answers. You can go and you can speak the truth in love. We'll continue on next week. Next week we're going to start with. And this is one that you, I'm sure you've heard. Well, you share the, you try to share the gospel with them. They say, well, you know what? I just don't think about it very much. What do, you, what do you say to that? We'll look at that a little bit next week. Lord willing. All right. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word and the fact that it, it applies in these situations that we face on such a regular basis. Lord, as we have opportunities, as we seek opportunities to share your word, I pray that you would help us, that you would give us the words to say, that we would have your word hidden in our hearts so that we can share the truth of your word so that it can make an impact on the lives of those who we love, who we share the gospel with. Lord, we trust you. Lord, we don't know if we're planting a seed or if we're watering a seed. Or, Lord, perhaps it will be our privilege to harvest a soul for you. But, Lord, it, it really all comes down to what you allow us to do and your working in their hearts. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the privileges that you give to us. I pray you bless now as we prepare our hearts for the morning service. I pray you'd speak just through every aspect of the service. You receive honor and glory in Jesus' name.